Welcome to Europe ECR 2023. My name is Jens Erik Nielsen Kusk. I'm an interventional cardiologist working at Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark. And with me today I have Professor David Hildig Smith working in Brighton Sussex University. And today we are going to discuss issues related to PFO closure and especially the indications for PFO closure. So, David, in 2017, we had results from four randomized clinical trials demonstrating the benefit of PFO closure in patients with a cryptogenic stroke. The patient enrolled in that trial, in three out of four trials, was in the age group from 18 to 60 years. Yeah. Only one trial uh, went up to 65 years. So, do you believe that we should restrict PFO closure to patients under an age of 60, or can we move up and also offer that for elderly patients? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And of course, the trials were done in that population because that group had the lowest incidence of potential confounders like atrial fibrillation, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the group in whom it was obviously felt we could actually accumulate the evidence. But of course, your PFO doesn't close of its own accord when you're 60. So there are plenty of patients into their 70s and beyond who, who may benefit from this. And of course, like you, we will do occasional patients, perhaps for other indications like hypoxia, but certainly there are some patients we are referred by the neurologists. We say, okay, I know this guy's 68 or 72 or whatever, but we've done all the tests. And we, the only thing we can find is that they have a PFO. So would you consider closing it? And certainly on an individual case basis, absolutely no problem with doing that. Although I understand the guidelines and guidance is yeah. not like that. I mean, do, do, you have, do you have the same experience? Yeah, I agree very much with you. And also one important aspect, if you look at the risk of venous thromboembolism and thereby the risk of paradoxical embolism, it will increase the risk with H. Yeah. So it makes sense that beyond 65, 70, 75, of course you can have a paradoxical embolism. Yeah. But also I think we need more data and it could really be nice to work uh, also on this age group beyond 60, 65 years and have more evidence on this. Yes, I mean the trouble is of course the evidence is so hard you know, it took us so long to get the evidence that we have and then if you introduce in the older age group the, the trying to get rid of those confounders and have a pure group is really, really hard. So I think, I mean, I think we, as the interventionists, should push and resist the, the guidance or guidelines that say you must stop at 60. There are undeniably patients over 60 who would absolutely benefit from this technology. So, Dave, also in our selection of patients for PFO closure, we take a yeah. look uh, on a PFO anatomy. Mm. And I think the data shows us that if you have an intraatrial septal aneurysm and if you have a large shunt, that's yeah. a type of PFO anatomy where you can really benefit from closing the PFO. Yeah. So my question to you is, should we in our patient selection look very much on this and limit our procedure to those PFOs uh, that we consider being high-risk PFOs? Yes, I see. I, I, I mean, I think some of the scoring systems would suggest that we do that, but I don't really like that approach because the scoring systems are good on a population basis, but they're not that useful on an individual basis. So the denominator of patients with an apparently small shunt and no septal aneurysm it may be huge. And to tell someone who's had a, a, a likely paradoxical embolus stroke that we're not gonna fix the defect because we think it's too small. Well, it wasn't too small to give me my stroke, doctor. So what do you mean it's too small? And actually, of course, and I think perhaps to be fair, the neurologists don't necessarily r recognize this fact that I, I will quite often get referred to somebody who say, oh, we found they've got a small PFO. It's like, no, you, you don't know that. No. You just don't no. know that. No. So they've had a test 
And during that test, the patient and the sonographer have to coordinate to do a valsalva to get the release and the bubbles come across. If you have a really well coordinated uh, uh, partnership, even with a two millimeter defect, you can fill the left atrium, left ventricle with bubbles. So yeah. the fact that you haven't seen that doesn't mean it's a small shunt. And, and very commonly, when we have referred those patients and we ignore that, you come to do the procedure, you test it with a balloon, ah, it's eight millimeters. Yeah. So I, I think denying, what, what I worry about on that is that people will be denied an appropriate therapy in the mistaken belief that the assessment has accurately shown that, no, this PFO is small, yeah. this PFO doesn't have any floppy septum, therefore they are low risk. Do you, do you, I don't know, do you feel the same? No, I, I think it's, it's quite uh, demanding and difficult actually to determine whether a shunt across the insatial septum is a small shunt or a large shunt. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, I totally agree uh, that when you try to s answer that question, you have to have a really cooperating patient doing yeah. a proper Valsalva, you have to do correct instructions, etc. And mm. I experienced the same. Mm. that some echocardiographers report a small shunt. I have the patient back in the cath lab. Just when I put the wire across, it opens up, and yeah. it's a large defect. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty yes. talking about a small and a large shunt. So yes. I, th I think we should be very careful in restricting PFO closure only to a certain type of uh, uh, PFO anatomy. Yeah, I fully agree. I do think there's a risk of denying suitable patients an appropriate treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, one of the, one of the things that we do in order to be confident that, that a stroke is PFO related is mm. that we really look for atrial fibrillation. And yeah. in many centers, it is, it is standard to do monitoring, but it's yeah. variable where you do two days of monitoring, whether you do uh, even implant a loop recorder for long-term yes. uh, monitoring, it's extremely variable. And also, it's a question, should we really do that if we have, let's say, a 35-year-old lady coming in? Uh, I mean, the chance of finding AF is so low. So would you do monitoring in all your patients, or where should yeah. the no, threshold I, be? I, I mean, I, I, I find this area quite difficult to understand why it is that we've got sucked so far down the route of screen, screen, screen for AF. You know, you've got a young patient in whom we've shown a PFO who we know they've had a stroke for an uncertain reason. Now, if you had somebody age 35 who has even persistent atrial fibrillation, they still don't even merit anticoagulation or, or, on their own. So why we spend so very long looking for atrial fibrillation in those patients doesn't really make any sense to me. It's a bit like, you know, in, in, in coronary disease, for example, you wouldn't say, ah, this patient's already got diabetes, therefore we're not going to bother treating their hypertension. Yeah, you, you, you treat it all. OK, I think, fine, if you want to look for atrial fibrillation <laughs> endlessly, I can't believe people put in implantable lube recorders for this indication. No. But so, so I think really a 24 hour tape is, is, is enough. If there are reasons why you think somebody might have atrial fibrillation and structural heart disease and other things that could mean it is feasible that they could have had a left atrial appendage thrombus, even at that age, I mean, it's, it's almost inconceivable. But if so, yes, fine consider that case on its merits. But the vast majority of patients have too much assessment for atrial fibrillation, yeah. in my view. Yeah. Once you've found a, 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 paradox, a likely paradoxical embolism based on the history and the echocardiographic findings, et cetera, you should close the PFO. Yeah. So I, I don't really get it. No, I, I agree. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult. And if you, on loop record or long-term holdering, find an episode of AF, being, let's say, three minutes, you yeah. don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Because we don't have proof that it is of benefit to put the patient on anticoagulation, so it's... No, absolutely, and yeah. I mean, you know, people being, you know, as a very general point, people are getting on anticoagulation 
a little bit too much in medicine as a whole, you know, for, for even very short periods of atrial tachycardia because people feel, oh, it's fine, I'll just put them on a DOAC. But, you know, that carries some risk. Yeah, totally agree. So maybe we could do without uh, monitoring for AF in the youngest patient and reserve it when we have a reasonably likelihood that this patient could actually have atrial fibrillation. That yes, and so obviously, let's say you were considering somebody age 68, whatever, then of course that makes more sense because yeah. they, if they did have atrial fibrillation, they would merit anticoagulation yeah. on it in its own right. But in the youngest patients, it really makes no sense to, to be quite so rigorous looking for AF. That's correct. So one scenario that we also experience as cardiologists are young patients coming in with acute myocardial infarction. Yeah. Looking at their coronary arteries, there's no sign of atherosclerotic disease in the yeah. coronary circulation. There's no signs of coronary artery dissection. But those, some of those patients, they actually have a PFO. And if you have ruled out other sources of thromboembolism. Yeah. I feel that there is a high likelihood that they have actually suffered paradoxical embolism to mm. the coronary circulation. And I think we should be aware of having a PFO is not only a matter of embolization to the brain, it can definitely also be embolization to the coronary circulation. So how will you manage uh, yes. those patients? So probably like you, we have a low threshold for arranging a bubble contrast echocardiogram on those patients. So of course, if you look at the likelihood of presenting with problem in the brain, it only has to be a millimeter and it, wide and it can be devastating. In the coronaries, probably has to be two, maybe even three millimeters wide and it can cause real trouble. Elsewhere in the body, mostly more silent, mostly. So in the coronaries, if you find the arteries are actually pristine, apart from a blunt occlusion in the mid of one vessel, and they're otherwise not having many risk factors for coronary disease, then you always have to think, ah, could this be paradoxical embolization? And I mean, I'm sure like you, we've picked up many and have closed many, uh, for this particular indication, but it doesn't really merit much attention in the guidelines, even though, of course, the coronary circulation takes whatever it is, 5% of the total cardiac output. So, I mean, I, I imagine you've, you, you have a, a group, a cohort as well, who've undergone PFO closure for this indication. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. sure. And it, it's definitely underrepresented, though, because yeah. I'm sure a lot of them yeah. get passed off as, OK, funny acute coronary syndrome, not really sure why it's happened, here's your statin Yeah, um, that's right. instead, which is a shame. Yeah. And they, we, we should probably focus a little bit on that as well. David, thank you very much for giving your view on, on some of the controversial issues here related to PFO closure here at uh, EuroPCR 2023. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jens, Eric.